Good morning. Good morning and welcome. I am your pastor, in case you missed me. But judging from the count of some of you may have missed last Sunday as well with me. We had a good time at the State Fair showing our cattle and the good support of people there. And I noticed on the video there were also a body of believers gathered to worship last Sunday, as there is today. And we welcome you into this place, into this house of God, a sacred place, a sacred place where I dare you to expect something to happen this morning. Let's pray. Dear God, our creator, our friend, we come to worship you today. We come to sing, we come to pray, we come to listen. You always hear us. Help us to hear you. Amen. Stand and pass the peace of Jesus Christ to your neighbor. The Lord is King, O oh, praise His name, or all the earth His grace proclaim. From age to age, from day to day, His wonders grow most gloriously. If you believe it, let's sing it together. for us this morning. Well, how are you guys today? Doing well? Good. Well, today we're going to talk about some things here. We're going to just we're going to start off by looking at some things. Anybody tell me what shape that is? That's a triangle, isn't it? And if I take this pair of scissors, and if I cut this, how many pieces would I have in that triangle? Two. Let's check it and see. Yep, two pieces, right? Oops. Yes. There 
there's two pieces. And if I do that with a square, kind of square, if I do that again, how many pieces? Two, and they're very separate, right? Now, I've got this big one right here. Big old band. Now, if I cut this one again, I'd have two, right? Let's see how it looks if I do that, okay? Now, let's imagine, if you will, that this is our relationship with God. And sometimes we do things that God doesn't like. We might lie. We might think bad thoughts. You know, things along that line. And God's relationship, his love for us, you know, is, is divided. And yet, even though we do things that God doesn't want us to do, even though we do that, even though there are now two, if you look, oh my goodness, we're still going to God, aren't we? So God never leaves us. God is always there for us, no matter what we do. No matter what things we do that he doesn't like, all we have to do is ask for forgiveness, but God is always connected to us. Okay? So let's say a little prayer, and then we'll send you back. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for your joy of the children. Thank you for being with us always, never leaving us, even when we leave you. We ask that you continue to be with us in the coming week. In your name, amen. Thank you, guys. I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward and they can place the, the, the bags up front here and the rest of you stand. We're going to take a second offering this morning. Give only if you feel appropriately by singing. But you'll see the verses that are up there and the things that you are being asked to give. Your life, your hands, your voice, your silver and your gold. Oh, that we did a little bit this morning already. My will and my love. As we sing these words, it's not just a song to sort of make the flow go between the offering and the next thing we got on the line here. It's a testimony of your life. Will you give these things to God as we prepare also to commission Sarah to a year of service? Remember verses 3 and 4 are a cappella.
What a powerful testimony. Imagine if someone actually was listening in on us this morning and heard us say those words. And what if they held us accountable to those words? Moreover, what if that was what we did our whole life's work with as we left this place? I will trust that our words meant what we sang. Speaking of that, I'm going to invite Sarah Balzer forward. Sarah is leaving on a year's worth of voluntary service. I won't say where, because she will say where. She's going to share just a little bit about what she is doing in voluntary service. Okay, so this Friday, I'll be headed out to Colorado Springs to begin my term with Service Adventure. Service Adventure is a 10 and a half month long program through Mennonite Mission Network. Um, during the year, I'll live in a unit house with three other participants and two unit leaders. After about a week of orientation, we will begin our job assignments. I personally will be working for um, the United Way there and also a more local program called the Interfaith Hospitality Network. Now, you could ask me exactly what I'll be doing at those jobs, but I probably would not give you a good answer because I myself do not know. They haven't really given me much information, but I'm sure I'll learn more during orientation. Um, apart from our regular job assignments, we also get to do, as a unit, a lot of really cool other things. Um, I know that we do a lot of work with the church there. We also get to do, um, when Rocky Mountain has their snow camps, we get to go help with that. I know the unit before has um, done small trips to Albuquerque to visit the other unit there and done things like hike up Pikes Peak. So those are all things I am very excited for. Um, I'm excited for the year in general as a whole. Um, I'm very thankful for all of the support that I've received from you guys so far. And I would just like to ask for your continued support and your prayers throughout the year. Thank you. I'm going to ask you one question, just put you on the spot here. I did tell you this beforehand. But people would ask us this too when we were in, in Bolivia. Why in the world? You graduated from high school. You could go to any college of your choice. You could get a job. Why in the world? do voluntary service. I mean, you're not getting paid. Uh, why? Um, I was kind of, when I was starting to think about doing this, it was kind of like coming to a changing point in my life, and I really don't, like, I don't know what I want to do, like, for a job, and I felt like uh, voluntary service was something that I was really called to do to kind of help me grow as a person and to, um, kind of figure out what I want to do with my life while helping other people. And I just think that it's a really great opportunity. Nice. And uh, I'll take that. Why don't you come to the middle here? And if I could have the deacons and the Peace and Social Concerns Committee come forward first and surround her in prayer. And then anyone else, if you would come and surround her in prayer in our time of commissioning as well. Every person who does uh, service or wants to do service, uh, voluntary service of some sort, can apply for... Uh, some funding to help them out with this because this is not uh, always free to the person either. They're sacrificing some time, yes, but some money as well. And uh, you have a scholarship available for you through the Peace and Social Concerns Committee, and that's why I asked them to come forward. The rest of you who are able and willing, stand or come and surround us in prayer as well. And if you in your place just want to lift your hand as a sign of blessing, that would be great, or join us up here. Heavenly Father, you call. You call just like you have called all your servants. And they have responded with, here I am, send me. Lord, you have called Sarah, and she has responded, here I am, send me. And you're sending her to Colorado. I pray a blessing on her, on her work. I pray that her work benefit other people, that your spirit flow through her in ways that she can't even imagine, and her gifts be expanded in ways that, that, that touch other people in ways they couldn't imagine. I pray that you walk with her in her community life, that you prod her, that at times you do make her feel uncomfortable, yet you are right there, Lord, with your rod and your staff to comfort and to guide her. Lord, I just pray that you keep her safe, that you keep her motivated, that you keep her solidly in the presence of your spirit expand your work within her and lessen her own 
uh, self within the sacrifice of her service. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, who said, come, follow me. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Go in peace and keep in touch. <laughs>
Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Heavenly Father, you whose wind blows through all things and refreshes or refines where needed, open now my mouth to speak our ears to hear, our entire beings to experience your spirit and your word. Amen. A uh, Tacoma, Washington newspaper carried the story of, a, of Tattoo, who is a little basset hound. And uh, Tattoo didn't intend to go on an evening run one evening, but when his owner decided that uh, he would go for a ride. He took him along on a leash, and uh, his leash got caught in the door with Tattoo stuck on the outside. And the owner took off, and Tattoo had to go on a run that he hadn't planned for. And as they went past the police, policeman Terry Gilbert reports, and quote, this is the way it was in the news story, he said, the hound was picking them up and putting them down as fast as they could go. And the officer chased the car to a stop, and Tattoo was rescued. It was estimated that the car got upwards of uh, as fast as 25 miles an hour. Now, for a greyhound, that's no problem, but for a basset hound, <laughs> that's picking him up and putting him down as fast as you can go. And he was relatively okay. Now, I wonder, it seems to me, at least if I'm somewhat normal, that that's maybe sometimes what life sort of feels like. We're putting them down and putting them up as fast as we can go. Life seems to be moving quicker and quicker, faster than we want to or we're able to go. And there might be different reasons for that, and we could take time to share that, but you can imagine what those reasons are in your own life. And so, we can either learn to keep up, go faster, or to let go. Right? I remember water skiing with a friend, and he was bragging about how good of a water skier he was, and I was uh, driving the boat, and uh, you know how it works with water skiing. He's ready, he goes, go! And we gunned it, and the thing tore him out of the water, and he was leaning back, and as he was leaning back, he leaned a little back too far, and he went to the front again, and boom, face plant. But he didn't let go of the rope. He kept on going, and we're all yelling, let go, let go. I mean, we didn't think about stopping the boat because uh, <laughs> it, was, it was too much fun yelling, let go. Well, he, he finally let go, and I guess to his benefit, it was better he did a face plant than the other way around. But he finally let go. So our only options are to keep up or to let go, right? Like Tattoo and my friend, it seems like in life we are being dragged. You know what's going on in your life. You know what makes it feel like, man, if I could just go a little faster, it would be good. If I could just let go, it would be good. But I wonder if keeping up or learning to go a little faster or just simply letting go really are our only options in this rat race called life. Maybe there's something better. Well, let's think it through a little bit first. Let's think it through these two options that, you know, you know how we are as people. It's always an either-or sort of situation. Let's think through our either-or, keeping up or, or letting go. Let's think it through. We can learn to keep up or we can learn to go faster with the pressures of life. How does that hold up? How many of us can really say, and here I ask for the wisdom of our elders, and maybe there's some of us younger people that, that, that have figured this out. How many of you say you have really ever fully caught up with life? Or actually you're a step ahead of life, even? Anybody? 
In fact, I suspect we all find that even if we get to that point where we think, all right, now we can kick it a little, life picks up again. It speeds up again. And we're running. We're putting them down and picking them up as fast as we can go again. Time Magazine noted that back in the 1960s, expert testimony was given to the U.S. Senate Subcommittee on Time Management. I didn't know they had a subcommittee for that, but I guess they had to manage their time somehow. So they had a subcommittee on time management, and that the expert testimony predicted, check this out, the testimony predicted that advances in technology would radically change how we would live our lives. They forecasted, 1960, that the average American would be working 22 hours a week within 20 years. That's the 1980s. How many of us were working 22 hours? <laughs> because, you know, we, <laughs> whatever, because that was full-time work. No. Check this out, then. This is an actual quote. I quote, said the experts, the great challenge will be figuring out what to do with the excess of time. So I guess that must have been a great challenge here at BMC in the 1980s, figuring out what to do with the excess of our time. Well, nearly 50 years later, today, after major advances in technology, after all, my phone, I'm connected to the world by my phone. It does all my email and all my text, everything in one thing. I could even turn off if I wanted to. I could turn up the heat or turn it down in my house and do all sorts of things remotely. I wonder, after 50 years, how many of us are struggling with figuring out what to do with the excess of our time. Not many of us. In fact, I think we find ourselves this technology in our human nature has made us even more busier, has made us busier. It's gave us more things to do. And I think this il illustrates something about life, and that is we will never catch up. This idea that we, if we could just run a little faster, if we could just work a little harder at catching up with the hecticity, if that's a word, of life, we'd finally get there. We'd be like, like Tattoo the Basset Hound would finally just be able to jog alongside a car going 50 miles an hour. Well, you know, as impossible as it is for a Basset Hound to keep up that speed, it's impossible for us to do that in life. So if that's the case, I suppose our only option then is to drop out, let go. Might be a little, might be a good option for a little while. I mean, after all, that's what vacations are about, if you do those sort of vacations. I'm going on a vacation this week to Minnesota. Um, drop out a little bit, not worry about what's going on. But we can't do that our whole life, right? We can't have vacation our whole life. We could be hermits. We could drop out if we don't want to be involved with society. We go live in the mountains somewhere, totally disconnect ourselves. But for the most part, we are social beings. We need interaction of other people. So that's not a possibility to totally drop out. So what then? So what then? If you agree with my premise, that we can't just go faster and keep up. In the end, that won't help us out. Or in the end, we can't just be on permanent vacation. What then? Well, I suggest to you this morning that once again, Jesus has a third way option for us. He gets at something that might help us this morning. Jesus' third way option comes to us in the form of a metaphor. Matthew 11. Nate already read it to us this morning. I'm going to reread it, but in the message, just to give another dimension of, of what Jesus is getting at here. He's talking to his disciples. He's talking to a people who are weary and tired. He's talking to a people who are in the rat race of life and are hoping that in 20 years they'll have to worry what, what they're going to do with the excess of their time. And he says this. He says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you born out, uh, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. I'll show you how to take a, a real rest. Come walk with me and come work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of life, of grace. 
I won't lay anything heavy, and in most of your translation, it's this image of yoke. Hold on to that. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Now, as I mentioned, Jesus actually in the passages compares his way to a yoke. To a yoke. I don't know how many of you are familiar with yokes, especially neck yokes of oxen. I don't think there are too many farmers here anymore that farm with oxen. In uh, my grandfather farmed with oxen in Paraguay and in Bolivia. They still farm with oxen on the side of the hills where you can't get tractors. And in fact, this is sort of a rabbit trail, but in fact, once a year they have an accident where an oxen rolls off the side of a hill. <laughs> Not a first world problem, obviously. <laughs> But people still farm with oxen. And the yoke is an image that Jesus used here. And I'm somewhat familiar with oxen because at Bethel College, I took a course called Principles of Sustainable Agriculture, and we took a field trip. And we took a field trip to Kalamazoo, Michigan, to a place called Tillers International. And there we learned how to build oxen yoke. And Tillers International is a place that works with appropriate technology for third world countries like Latin America and, and uh, Africa, where it would, it would just not make sense to, to give the type of technology that they're not ready for yet. And so we work with, with oxen, uh, with animal traction. And so we learned how to make oxen yoke, and we learned how to plow and how to disc with oxen. We did that with the, the commands, the he and the haw, and we got, we got some of the work done. Now, one of the most important principles that we learned with this was that for an oxen team to work efficiently, the yoke had to fit properly. You can't just take any beam of wood, slap it onto an oxen, and get him to work as efficiently as possible. That every yoke, in fact, is custom fit to the fit of the neck, and that the yoke itself, around, or the, the, the harness itself, fits into the neckline of an ox. And if it fits just perfectly and ox is pushing, it'll sink right in there into the seat of their, of their shoulders. It won't harm their bone and it won't, it won't chafe them. So there's a lot of crafting that goes into the comfortability of a, of a neck yoke. And we also learned that the two had to work together. Now this seems obvious. That the two had to work together or nothing would get done. That's the image that Jesus is working with this morning. He is talking to a people who are yoked in life with an ill-fitting yoke. Imagine yourself, what are you yoked to? What are the things to which you are connected and how do they fit into your life and into the dreams and into the faith and into the, the, uh, the, the movement of your life? And he's speaking to a people whose yoke is heavy or it's imposed upon them, or it is ill-fitting, if you keep up with the word picture. Like Tattoo the dog, like my friend, these people either have to learn to keep up with it, bear through it, or to give up as they struggle with the pressures of life. And I think he's as good as talking to every single one of us this morning. And like Jesus has a tendency of doing, Jesus offers an invitation. He doesn't just sort of say, okay, I gave you good material to talk about yokes on Sunday morning preacher. He says, Pastor Wilmer, I offer an invitation for you and for those listening. Jesus invites us. Jesus invites us. First, he doesn't say, keep up. I've got the five secrets of picking them up and putting them down faster. You just listen to me. On the other hand, he doesn't just say, let go of all yokes, throw them all away. But he says, come, take my yoke upon you. Invitation is come. Come. You come. Wilmer, come. Come to me and take your yoke upon me. Take my yoke upon you. My burden is light. Learn from me. So what might we learn, though, in life? I mean, if you're a curious person, well, that's great, an invitation. I got a lot of people inviting me to something or the other. 
But if I'm going to say yes to Jesus' invitation to put his yoke upon me, how do I really know? Or what might I expect if I put that yoke on me? What does Jesus' suggestion, invitation, mean for our lives? Let's think it through a little bit more. I'm going to share with you a little bit more about what I know about yokes from my experience at Tillers International. And I wonder if that might not help us receive Jesus' invitation more readily or more deeply. The first thing I learned about yokes is that yokes provide a connection. Yokes are made for two, not one. Yokes are made for two, not, not, not one. We are not meant to go through life living apart from other people, out of relationship of people or of God. In fact, one of the reasons oxen are paired up is not necessarily always for more pulling power. It's not just for, you know, if one is good, two will be better in terms of power. But also because oxen have been created in a herd mentality. And they are most comfortable and they are at most ease and they are at most uh, manageability when they are together. How often have we seen at a rodeo, or how often have we seen at, at county fair like we did last week, where if you get an unruly calf, put another steer or something in there with them, and that calms them down. There is benefit of being together in the midst of anxiety for the need of connection. There is a benefit of being yoked to God as we work. We might be able, or at least we think we might be able to do it ourselves, but it isn't always, I think often we think of the idea of yoking ourselves to God or to other people is to get more done. But see, then we're falling into that trap of either picking it up and going faster or letting go. I think what Jesus is getting at is saying, if you have someone beside you, your work is more steady. Your work is not fraught with as much anxiety, with as much worry with as much, the, or the tendency to think I can do it all. And when I fail, the tendency not to forgive myself. We have been created for companionship with God. And God's yoke fits well and is lighter than the one we have been pulling by ourselves or with the other entity we are yoked. Verse 11, or in chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus invites us, come, come be with me. Take my yoke upon you. Yokes provide connection and companionship. Yokes also provide direction. Think about it. I mean, this is obvious, but I think it needs to be said. The idea of a yoke pictures forward movement. <laughs> I mean, if you're yoked together, one can't back up and go forward at the same time. It doesn't work then. You are working together. You are moving forward. You are moving in the same direction with the same mission together. Sharing a load. Sharing a task. You cannot be yoked to Jesus and go your own way anymore. And that's the dangerous part of being yoked with Jesus. And I think often we take this verse to say, oh man, if I just take this yoke on me, man, it's all good sort of the, the elixir of all things. If I just take another hit from his yoke, life will be good. But the reality is, if you are yoked with Jesus, you are now going in the direction of Jesus. You are yoking yourself with the direction of Jesus. So it's not a thing or a secret you take on yourself. It's a direction a way of movement that you are yoking yourself to. Being yoked with Christ ensures that we are moving in a life-giving trajectory, moving in the way that God has been inviting people to move over the centuries, over the millennia. And the secret to this yoke, if there's any secret, is it is different than all of the other promises the yokes you have give you or the illusions they give you. It's not that you might actually have to pull or get sweaty pulling, but in the end, the reward. The reward is lighter. There is no burden 
to the direction you are going with Christ. Yoke. Yokes provide direction. Yokes provide, then finally, cooperation. In a time when we don't like to cooperate, it's very evident across the board if you take a look at our culture, we are not a very cooperative culture. In our politics, in our church, in our society, we have been, we have that seed, but a yoke sharpens that. Anytime more than one animal is yoked together, they have to cooperate. We can't get the job done. I mentioned that earlier. You quickly learn to work together. You quickly learn to bear the load together. And we don't bear the load fully ourselves. I think that's something that goes against our own culture, maybe even our own upbringing, this idea that I pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I can give, but receiving? That's for other people. A yoke is giving and receiving. Because if you don't, it's an unequal yoke. To be yoked together means that we cooperate with Jesus' work. Before we come to him, we've been living our own agendas. Now we are joined to his work. And the beauty of being in cooperation is that Jesus will not make us go faster than we keep up. Unlike tattoo, being dragged along or my friend being dragged along behind the motorboat, Jesus isn't just going to drag us. We're going to go a direction but the point of his yoke is, out of love, he moves us, teaches us, prods us to move forward. Jesus always makes sure that our mutual yoke will be a tool to share the load. To share the load. I think this is an image for the church. Our yokes are to share the load, not as a tool to drag other people along. One day a man went to see a farmer friend. He was plowing his field with a team of oxen and the man noticed that one animal was much bigger than the other animal and so he made note of it. He asked, well, you know, why, why do you have such an uneven team out there? And the response from the farmer was, was interesting. He said the big animal was an older animal, stronger animal, but an animal that uh, was well broken to the yoke had experience working in the field, had experience working with other animals. And the small one was a young animal, new to the yoke, not much experience, not much power, a lot of motivation. And the man asked, why then do you put them together? And the farmer gave an interesting reply. He said, well, you see, it's like this. The older ox is the best ox I have. He knows his way around the field. And the reason I put the younger one with him is so that the older, more knowledgeable ox can teach him how to plow. If I never put them together, the younger one would never learn. The younger one, out of its, its, its motivation, would either pull itself to death or it would stop working at all. But together, the younger ox the younger ox learns to cooperate and to rest in the strength of the older ox. So I submit to you this morning, we have at least three choices. I was wrong, we don't have two choices. We have at least three choices. We can learn how to keep up and run faster. Try it. We can try to let go unplug, try it. But the option I invite you to this morning is that we do neither of the above, but instead we make a deliberate decision to yoke ourselves to the practical, life-giving way of Jesus Christ. Come. Come. Come and rest in obedience 
in Jesus' way. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and I am humble at heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What better can there be? Amen. As a response, we won't sing today, but I want us to go deeper into Scripture, and we're going to share a Scripture verse together that is often bound together. This Scripture with Jesus' invitation to take on his yoke. If you turn to 828 in your hymnals, you will see Isaiah, or it'll be up there as well. We're going to read this scripture together. If you know Handel's Messiah, there's a beautiful aria that is based on the last verses of Isaiah 41, or Isaiah 40. And then it goes, and then the choir picks it up and sings, uh, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My burden is light. My yoke is easy. Let's read these scriptures together. I will read the the regular print, and you will read the, the bolded print. Isaiah 40, 1 through 11. Comfort. O comfort my people, says your God. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all the people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And the grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely we people are like grass. Get you up on a high mountain, a high place, maybe on top of the elevator in Bueller. O Zion, herald of good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings, lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah and to all people in Bueller and Reno County and all of Kansas, here is your God. and he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the the lambs into his arms, and he will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Promise of forgiveness. Promise that the yoke of Christ, even in the midst of the reality of death, which we are experiencing as a congregation this week as we've lost our good brother Alan Weens to lung cancer this week, promise that in the midst of our worst sin, there is hope that indeed Jesus' invitation to take his yoke upon him, to learn from him and to walk with him, is real and does not fade away. It never will. How would you give testimony to that God's great goodness in your life? How would you shout out from the elevator of Bueller, this is our God, he is here. 
This is what he has done, both small and great. Where would you call on God to say, God, I feel like the withering grass, like the withering flower. Lord, I need your help. How can we pray for you? Introduce any friends that are worshiping with us this morning and also uh, any announcements you might have. Raise your hand, introduce yourself, and then we will, we will pray together. I'm Charles Watkins. Uh, John Gray uh, passed away last year, and he was a member of the Burton Mennonite Church, and they're getting ready to do a sale out there. He is very generous with MCC. We're going to have three work days, uh, three coming up Wednesdays. It'll be from 8 till 12, and John Gray's place is uh, 914 North Burmack Road. So show up there physically, and we'll get it ready for him. I'm Ed Hatchell. First of all, I'd like to thank Joel, or Joel, Zane and Kristen for singing, and then introduce um, Zane's parents, Joel and Kathy, Alex and Addie. Welcome. Great to have you here. It's good to have you. Alan Weens's memorial service will be here tomorrow at uh, 10 p.m. with burial to follow. Yeah, let's meet at AM. <laughs> I agree with that. Also want to share that Wilbur Neufeld, our brother, uh, had a farm accident where he uh, had his tractor run over both his legs and uh, is in the hospital recovering from broken bones in the Hutchinson Hospital. So keep him in your, in your prayers uh, as the doctors discern exactly how they're going to approach the treatment there. Youth have their report tonight. Be there at Huffmansau. I won't even give the time. It's in your bullet. <laughs> I'm Jean Gordon, and I would like to introduce my mother is now here visiting us in church and will probably come with us every Sunday. Welcome. It's good to have you. Randy Swatsky. I want to make sure that everybody understands that his illustration of using the elevator was only a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's, there are several people and agencies that would probably <laughs> frown upon that, but it's a good metaphor. A <laughs> um, couple of things uh, that I'd like to share. Uh, I've read several things, and I don't know if this is accident or on purpose over the week, about the power of prayer. and. Uh, this is a very, this is a first world problem, if we want to use that as an example, that I shared with the deacons the other night. I had a very important thing that I had to do at work that required me to go take a test. I have, I am 59 years old and I haven't taken a driving test since I was 16. <laughs> and I had to go take a driving test on Thursday. And I asked for prayer on that and we prayed about it. And you know what? I backed a trailer into cones three different ways and never touched a cone. Hey. <laughs> so for whatever it's, well, not for whatever it's worth, that's not the right way to say it, but it does work. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about and tying our, our day together, this morning in our Sunday school class, there were several questions that there were statements that were made that we, we talked about Jesus's hard statements, these ideas, and how do we handle that? And we couldn't quite come to a conclusion, I think, of that. In our special music this morning, we shared about when I get where I'm going. Mm -hmm. And it made me tie this together and think how blessed that Alan is today because perhaps he has those answers that we didn't come up with. There, there are things in our finite mind that we will never understand. And however you understand heaven, whatever heaven will be, I think that at some point we get to that, when we are blessed to be there, we will find those answers. That, does that make that any easier for us here today? Maybe not. But I think it's, it's a positive way to think more of, of what's happened. Well, and it's a hope of if we truly yoke ourselves to Jesus, that that direction it takes us 
that it moves us toward those answers, whereas maybe the other yokes don't. We don't know that, but that's our hope. You know? Bob Friesen, I want to just dovetail into what Randy was sharing. At the end of the month, August 28th, you'll hear more about this as the month goes on, but the producers of this film, it's called War Room, they're the ones who also made Facing the Giants, Fireproof, Courageous. So this group's getting better at making movies. This is now their fifth one. Prayer is a powerful weapon, and um, it's compelling drama with humor, a heart that explores the power that prayer can have on marriages, on parenting, careers, friendships, and every other part of our life. So you'll hear more about this as the month comes along, but keep that on your calendar. B.J. Parsons. Uh, Greta handed me a couple of notes that she would like for me to read for you or uh, share with you. The children in Sunday school this morning, their lesson was about Ruth and Bozo and how Ruth gleaned extra grain from Bozo's field in order to have enough food for her and uh, Naomi to survive. We are all blessed and have extras in our home that we could glean from, uh, be gleaned from us. The children are being challenged to bring anything extra that they may have at home, clothes that are too small, toys they don't play with, canned goods, and et cetera, to Sunday school next Sunday so we can share our blessings with those in need. Items will be donated to the et cetera shop and the food bank. The second note. Sunday school material is in each classroom for the fall quarter. If you are no longer interested in teaching, please let myself or Greta know so we can, can, can begin looking for replacements. And by the same token, you can be fit. If you are called to work with the children in our church, please let us know. The children in our church are our best resources and wonderful to work with. On pastor's note, he gave us the metaphor of the older ox uh, working with the younger ox. And the older ox was there to take and train the younger ox. So if you think of yourself as being the older ox and our children being the younger ox, you have a great opportunity to help with that yoke. Thanks, pastor. <laughs> And one more, this is, um, we are working on Promotion Sunday. It is going to be geared around the Sunday school kids again. If you have a favorite Sunday school song that you would li like to sing on uh, Promotion Sunday, please let Greta or myself know so we can include it in the service. Thank you. Also make note that we have a candidate for our youth pastor position. Uh, the information of what's going to happen generally, sort of the general information of when he arrives and what's going to happen in those days uh, is in your bulletins. We don't not yet know he, which church he'll choose to, to worship with on Sunday morning, but uh, his name is James uh, Lockridge, and I pray that uh, you are in prayer as well as this time of getting to know him and in discerning whether this is a good fit, uh, whether this will be a fruitful thing that we're doing this weekend. So Please pray for that and uh, keep your eyes and ears open. Uh, Jim Bontrager, this oh, follows exactly what Wilmer said, but I wanted to follow up when I stood up front a couple months ago and let everybody know that in the youth pastor search, we had nothing. I mean, we had nothing. We, we looked everywhere. We, we were making cold calls. We had nothing. And I said, you know, remember, pray for us. The next day we had two names. The, the following on Tuesday I bumped into a guy at Tyler's tennis tournament who was a potential and um, 
I mean, we went from zero to three in two days. And so, you know, we're at this point now with James. And I uh, just want to say thanks for praying because it worked. All right. I'm going to speak the prayer, but I'll be absolutely confident that we are yoked together in this work, that you and your seat are praying alongside me. Let's lift all these things up to God and in, in, in thanksgiving and in concern. Holy God, we come to you this day as a diverse family. We bring energy of youth and we bring the wisdom of age we bring the steadiness of an adult and the freshness of a, of a child. We bring the arms of love and we bring the eyes of our faith. But God, we work in a world that overwhelms even all of these gifts put together. We know more violence than we can calm. Soothe the people, Lord. We know more suffering than we can touch. Heal your people, Oh God, we know more anger than we can mediate. We need your reconciliating spirit amongst us. We know more anger. We know more indifference than we can energize. Lord, light your flame under us. We know more sin than we can confess. And we ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your mercy, that indeed your yoke isn't too heavy. We pray for the family also of Alan Weens. Bring healing to them. Those have experienced other death in families that weren't mentioned today that are yet struggling with this loss in their relationship. Lord, be with them. Be with Wilbur and with the rest of the family as they wait and see what treatment to take, give his body strength to heal. Thank you, God. Thank you for your life. Your life when our tiredness, when our exhaustion stops all effort. Thank you for your calm when our impatience dulls our judgment. Thank you for your pardon when our pettiness sharpens our tongue. Thank you for your encouragement when failure destroys our esteem. Lord, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for MCC and the men and women that will help with the John Gray sale. Thank you for the youth group who will help with a sale this week here in town. Thank you for Sarah Balzer going out to Colorado to serve. Thank you for Randy passing his test and the testimony he gives, wisdom from his week. We thank you for a youth candidate, and I pray that in this process your will be done. Lord, we thank you that your yoke indeed is not too heavy. Your burden is light, and that even though we are like grass and like flowers of the field, you don't forget us, that indeed you and your salvation stand forever. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, our yoke. Amen. After the closing song, there'll be a, a short video. You are welcome to stay and watch it, uh, a video that uh, Don uh, put on there about a shepherd calling his sheep. And you may you may use that as a final illustration, or you may, may leave after the sending blessing. Um, actually, let's stand and sing, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us.
take his yoke upon you. The burden is light. The direction is eternal. And the companionship is forever and empowering. Jesus loves you. Go and invite others to join this movement. Amen. Come here, come here, come here.